Salvete de Scipoli. So today we're going to discuss Gaius Julius Caesar or Julius Caesar. Circa 100 BC birth, 44 BC death. Our objectiva to recognize key events in Caesar's life and place them in order. What did he do and when? And to judge Caesar in terms of Roman values and justify that evaluation. What kind of a man is Caesar and is he adhering to these Roman values? Well, I think it helps to be able to picture the person when I'm when I'm learning about them or thinking about them. So here's a lovely statue of Caesar looking very regal and imperator. Um, but here also is a primary source, Suetonius. He's writing in the first century AD. He's a historian and wrote a biography of Caesar. And he wasn't actually very flattering, so whatever he has to say must be true. He says Caesar was tall, with a fair complexion, shapely limbs, a full face, and keen black eyes. That he had sound health, except his epileptic fits and fainting fits. He was fastidious in the care of his person. Now, this might actually really tell us what kind of a man he was, because not only can we picture him, but how a person presents himself often can say a lot. So he's fastidious in the care of his person. He keeps himself trimmed and shaved. And even at his body hair plucked, he was vexed by his baldness, so much so that he combed his hair forward over the crown of his head. So Caesar had a comb over. Nice. His dress was also considered unusual. He had a purple striped tunic, which was not weird, but the fringe sleeves down to the wrist would have been. And he wore his belt, but loosely fastened. He had a tough childhood, so let's get into this life. What Now we know what he looks like. What happened to him? Well, he was born into a patrician family around 100 BC. They had noble roots, meaning that his name was important, specifically the Iulii family name, which he is going to trace all the way back to Venus herself and Aeneas. <clears throat> he, at the time though, his family really had no wealth or influence when he's born. They've only got this old name. And he does lose his father to illness at age 15 or 16. So not exactly easy. Civil war is raging when he is born. Between the Populares and the Optimates, these two generals and consuls, one each at different times, Marius and Sola, um, are fighting each other. Big, big things. And the Populares and the Optimates, it used to be the Patricians and the Plebeians. Now it's these Populares and these Optimates because things are divided now by, by wealth and those in favor of the common man versus in favor of the aristocracy. Well, Sola is going to eventually become dictator and be empowered at the time that Caesar is going to be rising up as a young man. This is difficult for Caesar because Marius is actually his uncle by marriage with his aunt Julia. So, how is this difficult? Well, when Sulla returns and has power, he's going to order Caesar to divorce Cornelia. Cornelia is Caesar's first wife, who is a... Um, part of the populares because her father was a big supporter of them. So this means that Caesar has populares through marriage and remember populares because of his uncle Marius. And for whatever reason, he won't divorce her. And when he won't, Sola is basically like, look, I'm going to take your priesthood away from you. This is the only position that he's held up, up until this point. It wasn't really a political position. It was more of just getting him in the public eye. Um, he takes his family inheritances, and Caesar doesn't have a lot, but he takes it from him. Now, where he is wealthy is Cornelia. Cornelia's dowry, Cornelia, was worth bank. Maybe that's why Caesar kept her around. Either way, she had a lot of money, so they had a lot of money. And he possibly, sources differ on this, totally prescribed him, which means that he put him on a black list. Even worse than a black list, it was a death list, um, or it most certainly almost seemed to mean that. Sulla said, though, eventually giving in to Caesar's supporters, the supporters of him as a person his and his family friends, have your way and take him. 
Only bear in mind that the man you were so eager to save will one day deal the death blow to the cause of the aristocracy, which you have joined with me in upholding. For in this Caesar, there is more than one Marius. Remember, Marius is his uncle by marriage. She was the leader of the populares. So he is saying that Caesar is going to do more to tear down the aristocracy than Marius was ever able to accomplish. We'll see. Caesar is scared. He's scared by this. He's scared by Sulla's attacks. He has no money. He has no inheritances. He has nothing left. So he decides, be all you can be. And he pursues a military career to please Sulla. He ends up actually um, going toward Asia Minor. So just to give us a little context of where he is. He's awarded the civic crown. He serves with distinction because he saves a civilian in battle. So early on, Caesar doing great things already. He's so trusted that he is sent by himself to King with a small small aid in tow to King Nicomedes to get more aid, to get some naval assistance, if you will. King Nicomedes actually becomes a mentor to Caesar, which, I mean, that has to help, right? Having a king as mentor, though there are rumors, scandalous, scandalous rumors, that they might have had a little more than a mentor relationship going on, if you know what I mean, but we can't really know that for sure because of all the Roman gossip. Around 78 BC, though, ding dong, the wicked witch is dead, Sulla is dead, and it's safe for Caesar to return home. A couple things happen on his way back. First, he's going to stop and study some oratory. He's going to study it with Cicero's teacher, right? So this is great because he's getting the best of the best. Cicero is known as the best order. And the Magister Ciceronus actually said that Caesar should have first rank. Well, Caesar doesn't choose first rank in the school. He chooses second because first rank means you're going to go on to study oratory. And Caesar is apparently that good. He has that much natural skill, but he doesn't want that. He wants a political and military career. He's also captured by pirates. Yo, ho, ho. So this is what Plutarch, another primary source from 1st century AD, writing just before Suetonius, says about this little incident with the pirates. And I want you to think, what does this say about Caesar? To begin with, then, when the pirates demanded 20 talents for his ransom, he laughed at them for not knowing who their captive was, and of his own accord agreed to give them 50. So he said, you fools don't even know what I'm worth. I'm going to give you 50. In the next place, after he had sent various followers to various cities to procure the money and was left with one friend and two attendants among Sicilians, most murderous of men, so are these pirates, he held them in such disdain that whenever he lay down to sleep, he would send and order them to stop talking. So he's trying to sleep. He's like, I'm your captive. I don't care. I'm going to order you anyway. Stop talking. You're bothering me. For eight and thirty days, for thirty-eight days, as if the men were not his watchers, but his royal bodyguard, he shared in their sports and exercises with great unconcern. He also wrote poems and sundry speeches, which he read aloud to them, and those who did not admire, he called them illiterate barbarians to their faces. Like, really? What kind of a man is this? And he often laughingly threatened to hang them all. As a continuation and finish of this story, it should be noted that obviously he, he pays the pirate ransom, right? He gets the money, it comes, he's let go. He take, comes back with soldiers, takes them, puts them in jail, and asks the leader of the province to, um, to go ahead, the governor of the province, to go ahead and persecute them. But he's acting too slowly, so Caesar takes matters into his own hands and he goes into the jail, the prison, gets the pirates back out, and it's said that he uh, crucified all of them and that he slit their throats first to show them mercy of a short death, but then crucified their bodies. What kind of a man is Caesar? Of course, this little pirate story, um, as well as his adventure, his saving of the civilian in battle and his study at the oratory school would have all boded well with how the people felt about him. What else did he use to win the favor of the people? Well, his eloquence in general. 
won the favor of the people as an advocate in the law courts. So your advocates are going to defend right to call to um, are going to defend people in the law courts and advocate for somebody. And he did this quite well. Also, he won it through the friendliness of his manners. He was nice to them. Original politician. Schmoozing, shaking hands, kissing babies. Also, not only was he just nice in talking to them and would actually talk to them, he had lavish hospitality. He put his own money into things such as the Appian Way when he was curator of it, and he paid for theatrical performances, banquets, gladiatorial games, etc. This meant that Caesar was also constantly in debt, but he knew how to win the people, right? Do things for them. Give them things to entertain them for free. Help them. So he's going to rise through the Cursus on Norum very quickly, actually. Uh, so let's see how he does this. Before he gets to Gaul, how does he get there? Well, when he arrives back from the pirates, he's elected as military tribune. Okay, elected position by the people in 72 BC. Now, and to be military tribune, you also obviously had to be a soldier. You did not have to be a plebeian, so he gets elected this position. People love it. He also then becomes quaestor in Spain in 69. Remember, as soon as he gets the first magisterial seat, he is a senator for life. So now he's in the Senate. He's already made it there. Um, while in Spain, it's said that he was either reading about the Alexander the Great or saw a statue or both, but that he became so frustrated with himself that he cried because Alexander at the had accomplished um, conquering the known world and more at his age, at the same age as Caesar was at that point, and all Caesar was was a lowly quaestor. What does this say, uh, you know, about him? These feelings, right? What are his ambitions? Well, I think it's pretty clear. He continues up the cursus on Norum. He becomes idle, idle, sorry, idle in 65 BC. Then he's going to become Pontifex Maximus, the highest priesthood, right? Not exactly part of the Cursus on Norum, but an important position in Rome. Very important in 63 BC. Prider, we're almost to the top now in 62 BC. Remember, some of these positions, like Prider, once you're Prider, you become pro Prider the next year of a place. So he's sent back to Spain because he did a good job as Quaestor there. He did, and in 61 BC, sent back there as pro Prider which means that he's basically head of Spain. He's, he's taking caretaker of Spain. He has many successes. He subdues tribes that are revolting. He um, secures areas that weren't secure. He even gains some new land, basically covers all of Spain and secures it. And it, he's so good as a general that he has bestowed the only honor his troops can, which is the declaration of him as imperator. And this is a, this is a high honor as your troops are the only ones who can bestow it. And it's not bestowed very often. It's very successful. So he's gone up this cursus on Norum, and he's just killed it. You know, he's already up here, right? He's he's gone through, and he's been a tribune. Most people, at, most patricians, would not have been able to do this, but he's been a military tribune. Then he went the traditional path. He was quaestor, right? On up, on up until he's finally pro -prider. And pro is an office that carries imperium. That means you have authority, you have some command, um, as well as prider. This is important. The only next step is the top. Plutarch says of Caesar and his ambition, we are told that as he was crossing the Alps, now this was on his way to Spain to be pro -prider. And passing by a barbarian village which had very few inhabitants and was a sorry sight, his companions asked with mirth and laughter, Can it be that here too there are ambitious strifes for office, struggles for primacy, and mutual jealousies of powerful men? Ha! Oh, right. Whereupon Caesar said to them in all seriousness, I would rather be first here than second at Rome. What kind of a man is Caesar? Well, the kind that climbs to power forms the first triumvirate. He needs help getting that consulship with Crassus and Pompey, both former consuls, actually, in their years. And they didn't, they didn't get along very well. They wanted some of the same things, but they didn't get along. So this old guy 
right here, looking very stern. That's Crosses. Crosses is an old money patrician. He's got tons of money, and he has a bunch of the Senate in his pocket because of this. So he has a lot of back behind the scenes influence. Not really any military experience going on or greatness, but a lot of kind of clout with his money and his old name. Pompey, on the other hand, is just the opposite. Also known as Pompey the Great, he has conquered and subdued tribes in lands and gained more land for the Republic than anyone will until Caesar. So Pompey being Caesar's right predecessor for this being the most famous general thing. So he, Caesar allies himself with two of the best people that he possibly can to form this loose political alliance, not an official thing, just a loose political alliance called the First Tri, meaning three, we are meaning man, triumvirate. The opponents called it, the opponents of them called it the three-headed monster. And he does get elected consul in 59 BC. He becomes consul, remember there have to be two, with Calpurnius Bibulus. Calpurnius Bibulus is actually a part of the Optimates, and Caesar had originally aligned himself to be elected consul with another popularis. But the Optimates are so scared of him that they put all their power into getting Bibulus elected with him because they don't want a full popular, popularis um, consulship. Well, it doesn't even matter because Calpurnius Bibulus is so intimidated by Caesar. You know, maybe it's Pompey's guard that's always following him and going to the forum with him when he's declaring things. Or maybe it's how much the people love him because of the controversial reforms that he's putting through. Um, either way, Calpurnius Bibulus doesn't do anything and pretty much locks himself up in his house all the time and just sends news about the auguries and the um, and the haruspice that he that he sees bad signs whenever Caesar tries to pass a reform and Caesar just ignores it. Um, so the year actually becomes known jokingly or in maybe in partial seriousness as the year of Julius and Caesar rather than the year of Caesar and Bibulus as it should have been. Uh, these reforms, it's worthy to note, were for land distrib redistribution that redistributed some public lands and, and, and some actually even some other lands to the poor um, to give them somewhere, especially those with multiple children, and debt forgiveness for the commoners as well. So again, helping this common man, this popularist philosophy. Um, he knows he's going to be in trouble, though. So, he, you know, when he gets out of office, because his opponents are not going to like what he did while in office. And you only serve as a consul for one year. So with some intelligent political maneuvering, he gets a governorship of Gaul. Remember, consuls are supposed to get a governorship after they serve as consul, and he gets it for five years, which makes him immune to political persecution as long as he's in office. Um, and he's going to go to Gaul immediately after the consulship, and he gets there in 58 BC. Pretty early, though, he realizes that the situation is still not good for him, and he meets to re-secure the alliance with Pompey and Crassus. This is around 56 BC, and he um, you know, wants them to go for the consulship again, and he also wants his governorship to be renewed and for them to pass through that measure. So he gets it renewed for another five years. This means that he has 10 years possible that he could not be persecuted as long as he's governor in Gaul. We know that this is the time of fame for him, the Gallic Wars. Between 58 and 51 BC, he is governor of Gaul, and he extends the Roman Empire more than anyone else has, even Pompey. Um, a couple of notable things he does, very interesting things. He has this incredible engineering feat that he does where he builds a bridge across the Rhine River into Germania just to go look around, and then he takes it down. Very interesting. You know, who does this? And then in 54, he also does a reconnaissance, which he's not really trying to populate Britain. He just wants to go there. And he goes there in 54 BC. Unfortunately, his governorship does end. And in 49 BC, he's called back. He is ordered by Senate by the Senate and Pompey, who unfortunately at this point had drifted apart from Caesar. Their political alliance had gone down. Crassus is dead. Um, 
and Pompey's been taken into the Optimates, a little brainwashed, if you will, if you will, by the aristocracy who he always wanted so hard to be a part of. Because remember, he he wasn't really a part of that old money. And they bring him in, and he and the Senate order Caesar to disband his army and return to Rome because his governorship is done. Caesar knows that if he goes back, he faces all these charges that you know could get him exiled stripped of things, killed. So he's not going to do that. And by denying them, he's also committing treason and insubordination, according to them. Alia yocta est. This can be translated several ways, but I like the die has been cast. I like to throw that nice passive in there, meaning that the, the die has been rolled. Well, let's see what happens, because... He's going to cross, Caesar is going to cross the Rubicon River, right? He's going to go across this little stream. And by crossing the Rubicon, which is the border of his area of governorship into Rome, he is declaring civil war. He is crossing with his army. If he crosses a private citizen, it would have been fine, but then he faces all those charges. So he knows, and now he's got treason and subordination against him. He's charged no matter what. All he can do is go and try to take Rome himself. So he does. And effectively starts a civil war. But Pompey flees south. So Pompey's going to flee south. Right. And he does so successfully with some of the other senators. He goes from Spain to Illyria to Greece and finally ends up in Egypt. And in 48 BC, Caesar has secured everything, um, mostly. And he declared, he set up a rump Senate. He's used the senators there. He gets other senators, uh, you know, put into place and he gets himself declared dictator. And he announces Mark Antony as his master of horse. Mark Antony's always been a supporter of Caesar as a tribune himself. Um, Caesar is going to immediately resign dictator pretty quickly. He's, he's not all about being king. He, he gets elected consul legitimately, and he's going to go on and chase Pompey now that he has a legitimate election. And Pompey actually gets killed. And Caesar wasn't going to kill Pompey because Caesar had said no more prescription, which was that cross, that thing that Sulla used, right, where he took people's lands and killed them. Caesar said he wasn't going to do any prescribing. He was going to show clemency right, to those um, against him. So when Pompey is killed and in Caesar's head and justly killed and not the death he deserved, Caesar kills his killers. And he stays in Egypt, which is where Pompey was, and puts Cleopatra in power. So if you've ever heard of that they had a relationship, that's where it begins. And, but he still has more work to do at home. So he goes back and he crushes his political opponents, mostly Pompey's supporters and sons. Um, he gets declared dictator for 10 years in 46 BC. Also during that time, he's elected third and fourth terms as consul. None of this should actually be able to be happening, you know, consecutively and successfully. But now, by now, Caesar has a large support base in the Senate through people that he's put in there. The people love him. The people have loved him since the beginning of his career. And in February 44 BC, he is elected dictator for life. Well, we know the Romans had sworn in 509 BC that they would never have a king again. So can you imagine how the government, and by the government, I'm talking about the aristocracy, the optimates who are left, and maybe even some of the older populares in the Senate saw Caesar. Well, they're seeing him as the end and the death of the Republic. So the Ides of March, on March 15th, 44 BC, a small faction of conspirators meets in the Senate and meets with Caesar and kills him. And that's it, guys. That is the life and death of Julius Caesar. Well, late take.